Good evening. Uh, well, actually, good afternoon, uh, blog viewers. Um, we will be continuing to discuss um, the uh, the good of uh, political involvement today. We've we've blogged about it in several other posts, but today we'll get back to it. And uh, in in many ways, this this issue is uh, first. We have to talk about why are we discussing uh, politics on a blog devoted to the human good, and in what sense are we discussing politics? Um, because one thing that we're not doing on the blog is is discussing what um, what is the best political regime, or um, what are the best laws that a state should adopt, or what is uh, what is the best partic uh, particular candidate for a particular office. All of those questions are sort of specific questions that can be addressed through the political realm. Um, here on the blog, we are addressing the more fundamental question of uh, what is uh, good about political involvement for man, and even if there is any such good uh, uh, to be found in politics uh, by the nature of political involvement. And by that uh, question, uh, it's sort of a, it's a question that should, uh, should be true regardless um, of the political regime, so that if it's good to participate in politics now you know, for a certain set of reasons, it would be good in another hundred years to participate in politics for the same reason. So that is the, the question we are addressing in the blog when we discuss politics, not whether uh, particular uh, laws are just or particular regimes are just or uh, how we should uh, go about um, organizing um, uh, or, or establishing laws on specific issues, but um, what is the good for man in political involvement. And so far, um, we've taken, um, we've looked at some of the um, authors and writers and thinkers, and um, some of them have uh, sort of de-emphasized the importance of politics. And uh, and uh, Isaiah Berlin was one of those um, authors that we discussed. Um, others, of course, um, uh, stressed the, the many virtues of political involvement and uh, political life, um, and including Aristotle. And this schism as to the level of involvement man should have in politics is very, 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 very deep and very long, of long-standing origin. You can basically trace it back to Plato and Aristotle themselves, uh, the first political philosophers. Um, Plato, of course, um, in many ways is regarded as, um, uh, you know, more concerned with universal questions, questions of the forms, uh, questions of individual importance for people. And uh, in his own life, he um, he had the desire to be um, get involved in politics, but uh, he didn't find it very rewarding. In one of his letters, the letters uh, letter seven, uh, Plato talks about his youth, and he says that when he was a young man, he was very interested, had political ambitions. He was able to um, uh, through through some relatives, um, uh, sort of uh, have the opportunity to get involved in political uh, affairs and offices. But then as he started to participate, uh, he was shocked. And uh, he was shocked that uh, the city was, uh, well, first first he had sort of, you know, ideals that, you know, politics would be the way to pursue justice. But over time, uh, he says, as I, as I watch the people in politics um, uh, go about um, uh, uh, their affairs, I, I realized that they were not on the path of justice and that, and that, uh, then he says, the more I reflected on, uh, upon what was happening, upon what kind of men were active in politics, and, and upon the state of our laws and customs, and the older I grew, the more I realized how difficult it is to manage a city's affairs rightly. For I saw it was impossible to do anything without friends and loyal followers, and to find such men ready to hand would be a piece of sheer good luck, since our city was no longer guided by the customs and practices of our fathers but to train up new ones was anything but easy. And he says here, And the corruption of our written laws and our customs was proceeding at such amazing speed uh, that whereas at first I had been full of zeal for public life, when I noted these changes and saw how unstable everything was, I became in the end quite dizzy. Uh, it's a, that's an important uh, thought there. He became dizzy once he saw um, all of the different changes in public life and, and how unstable everything was. Um, and though I did not cease to reflect how an improvement could be brought about in our laws and in the whole Constitution, yet I refrained from action, waiting for the proper time, 
At last I came to the conclusion that all existing states are badly governed and the con condition of their laws practically incurable without some miraculous remedy in the assistance of fortune. And I was forced to say in praise of true philosophy that from her height alone was it possible to discern what the nature of justice is, either in the state or in the individual, and that the ills of the human race would never end until either those who are sincerely and truly lovers of wisdom come into political power or the rulers of our cities by the grace of God learn true philosophy. So Plato here is taking a very um, um, clear position on the limits of, of a man's involvement in politics. Uh, he stresses that there are um, uh, complexities in the laws, that uh, the state of affairs as it is, is uh, in most cities is very badly governed, that the, that the people involved in politics uh, have been corrupted, the laws are corrupted, the customs are corrupted, and all of this is happening, he says, at an amazing speed, uh, and that someone like himself that sort of had this genuine um, zeal to uh, pursue justice in politics became dizzy. Once he saw all this going on, he just, it, it overwhelmed him, and he thought that instead of um, pursuing uh, while not neglecting his city's affairs, um, he thought that it was not through politics but through philosophy um, that he could um, bring about an improvement in the lives of his fellow citizens uh, because he thought from, uh, from the, only from uh, the philosophic uh, enterprise could man discover what justice is and what the just regime is and not from politics. So that was Plato's view, um, uh, which is a very different view um, than what uh, Aristotle, um, who came after him. And of course the difference between, one of the big differences between Plato and Aristotle is kind of, is, is very memorably captured in a, in, a, um, uh, in, a, in a painting by Raphael, The School of Athens, where Plato is pointing to the sky and Aristotle is pointing to the ground. Um, and uh, I think someone said that everyone is a, in some form either a Platonist or Aristotelian in that we either have this um, uh, tendency to look at the stars and the cosmos, uh, to philosophy, to ideal questions or theoretical reason, or that we're more practically grounded as Aristotle was, um, looking down at human affairs, looking at uh, the world as it is. And so Aristotle, given his orientation, was, was much more, did not have the view at all that Plato had in, in, letter, in that letter seven. Um, uh, he, he did not view at all politics in that sense, but viewed the good citizen, um, a citizen as being someone that uh, uh, would be wanting to rule over others and be ruled uh, in, his, in, in a city or community. And uh, that, that is part of the Aristotelian uh, virtue, uh, to, be, to rule and to be ruled at the same time uh, or within succession. And that is what mar marks a virtuous person. Uh, so uh, Aristotle came to a very different idea of, of, of the good uh, for, for a man in terms of politics. He urged man to be political. He said man was a political animal, in fact, whose, whose sort of highest aspirations outside of contemplative study uh, and practical affairs could be reached by politics. He also thought that the person that, uh, you know, the virtuous person would seek to uh, instill virtue in others uh, and... Uh, uh, you know, improve the morals of his community. So uh, he was not, in that sense, um, uh, sort of, iso I would say, individualistic as Plato was. Um, so that is, a, in a nutshell, the schism between the two, and I think that schism is what we will um, discuss today when we get to the work that we're going to discuss later, Democracy's Place by Ian Shapiro. Um, so obviously now, in, in many, in our own country and in many countries, uh, you know, politics is 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 conducted through the uh, uh, regime of democracy. We live in a democratic age. Uh, many countries have become democratic uh, lately in the recent times, and uh, and so uh, the same problem of whether man should involve himself in politics is there, but the uh, institutions are different. Uh, now we have democracy, and, and I want to talk about some other differences. Uh, so. Um, whereas in Plato and Aristotle's day, cities were quite small and uh, uh, laws on issues were quite limited, uh, now we face a situation where we have explosive, uh, explosive 
uh, complexity in politics, explosive uh, growth in politics, explosive uh, regulation in politics. The state has become so large. Um, the number of um, uh, laws has proliferated. So uh, the, the, the complexity that Plato was talking about has probably been infinitely uh, magnified now in, this, in our age. Um, we have, for example, not only do we have governments on, for example, on international level, we have various treaties uh, between nations, the UN, uh, the, uh, certain international coalitions. Uh, we have national governments, the U.S., uh, the presidency the, with its executive orders, the Congress, the, Jude the Supreme Court. Um, uh, so we have an international and national government. We have a state government, um, you know, regulating on its own issues. Uh, and beyond even that, we have a local government. Uh, and in a city or maybe a county, um, and uh, God knows what other uh, things we have. Even some communities have their own uh, community association that has rules. So uh, <clears throat> this is very different than uh, the community uh, in which Plato and Aristotle uh, philosophized about politics. This is a very um, uh, different world. Uh, first, on the level of the government, number of types of governments. Uh, next, on the level of the number of types of laws, we have now laws on everything. Uh, we have uh, so many laws. Uh, we have laws on parking regulations. We have laws on windmills and how they are regulated. You know, we see the windmills in the desert. They have to be a certain, you know, height and length. Um, we have laws on food and drugs, expiration dates, uh, food and drug safety. We have laws on noise regulations, uh, curfews. Uh, we have laws on trash pickup and what you can put in the trash, even, you know, whether you can put certain things in the trash or not. You can get fined for that. There's laws on all those issues, um, what bins you have to put your trash in. Uh, we have laws on um, uh, various forms of amusement that people engage in, gambling. There's intensively regulated uh, area. Um, restaurants are regulated. So there's laws everywhere. And so we've, we've had an explosion in the number of subjects that are subject to like regulation now, uh, which certainly did not exist at the time of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, and in addition to that, we have now in our political life uh, n uh, no shared conception of the good or, or uh, the good life or what it means to be a good citizen. Uh, we have even beyond no shared conception, we have deep skepticism as to whether such things even exist whether there is such a thing as a good man, whether there is such a thing as a good regime, whether there is such a thing as a good citizen. Uh, many people don't believe that those terms mean anything uh, in political affairs. Uh, there's no shared uh, consensus on a lot of those issues. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, uh, doubt as to whether uh, there's a path to get to answers on those or whether it's even worthwhile, I would say, to even theorize about that. I think most people in politics now don't even think it's worthwhile to think about those issues, which was a very different conception of politics and, uh, than in the ancient times. So uh, all of this is to say that uh, the world that um, uh, we live in now in terms of political involvement has become extremely complicated, extremely complex, extremely time-demanding and absorbing, and participation in political affairs uh, is much more involved than it was in the, in the day of Aristotle and Plato. And if Plato was right, that even at that time, um, uh, politics was an incredibly confusing, uh, almost futile attempt to try to affect change, then uh, it should really give us pause to think how, what it means today to try to, uh, to affect change through politics. Um, so, of course, now we live in a time getting to... Uh, Ian Shapiro's work. Shapiro is, by the way, a professor um, of philosophy and political science at, uh, at Yale. And uh, his book, Democracy's Place, is a series of essays about um, the proper role of democracy in modern times. He's, he's somewhat of a philosopher, um, but he's also um, a very uh, grounded in empiricism and, and the scientific methods of political science. And uh, fairly quickly, he um, lays out sort of the, um, uh, the good of democracy and sort of the, the bad. 
he um, sort of dispels the notion pretty quickly that democracy is always a good for all people at all times. Uh, democracy, in fact, um, the empirical evidence that he cites um, have shown it within within um, within um, universities. Uh, the research that's been done shows democracies can often re lead to completely unjust outcomes, completely irrational decisions, uh, and, and can uh, replicate uh, um, inequalities that already exist in social structures. So while democracy is imagined or hoped to be a um, uh, almost a um, uh, synonym with justice, um, it's not. Uh, and I think that, that that claim has been really shown to be false that uh, democratic institutions can become uh, very uh, unjust and uh, while still um, maintaining the potential to be, to be just. Um, uh, while, uh, while Shapiro um, certainly is aware of the problem with um, democracy and its attainment of justice, he, he does um, reject as well the idea that there's a, a better alternative to democracy. Um, he doesn't think that um, there is a better alternative, um, mainly because any sort of non-democratic uh, solution uh, would involve, in his term, uh, vanguards, experts, and ambitious uh, blueprints that would, which should cause us to be suspicious of any claims made on their behalf. Um, given, he says, given the limitations of social scientific knowledge, the appropriate course is to attend to particular impediments to democracy rather than devise grand schemes and where possible. Sorry, there's a helicopter. Uh, I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> So, um, he says, given the limitations of social scientific knowledge, the appropriate course is to attend to particular impediments to democracy rather than to devise grand schemes, and where possible to find ways to induce people to democrat democ <coughs> sorry, democratize their interactions for themselves rather than impose democracy on them. Um, he says later, um, again, that, uh, um, that the idea that anyone has any sort of political expertise is suspect there are a few reasons to believe that there is uh, much of anything called political expertise. He says, what is typically billed as knowledge about the world of politics seems so meager and is so regularly undermined by events that people who set themselves up as political experts often give off the whiff of snake oil. Um, he has a theory, again, uh, uh, later on he says, um, Democrats are committed to rule by the people. They insist that no aristocrat monarch, bureaucrat, expert, or religious leader has the right in virtue of such status to force people to accept a particular conception of their proper common life. So uh, in this sense, um, Shapiro is very grounded in, in saying that um, while democracy certainly has problems, um, it, any non-democratic alternative would involve experts or um, technocrats and uh, their pretensions, their, their pretensions the political expertise are just that. Uh, their pretensions and there's no proof of uh, political expertise, therefore we should um, rely on democracy. And, and the gap, I can't find the page where he says it, but the argument that there's a gap between the ideals of democracy and its actual practice, to Shapiro, he, he tackles that and says, that doesn't mean we should demand democracy, but that we should work to bridge the gap. And I think that's a big part of what he says throughout the book that the democratic alternatives are not um, attractive, but what we should, what what um, what individual citizens should do uh, in terms of political affairs is work to demo democratize um, democracy as much as possible. Um, and I'll get into what he means by that shortly. Um, uh, he um, he certainly on this question on on, on the involvement of man in politics um, and, and the good of, of uh, becoming politicized uh, for man. Um, I think um, I think uh, uh, Shapiro takes a very moderate stance as well here. He says um, that uh, that although democracy is is very important to ordering social relations, uh, that it is not um, the only good for human beings. It is not the highest human good, and that it should not dominate the activities we engage in. 
He writes here, democracy operates best when it conditions our lives without thereby determining their course. They, they, our lives, require much else as well to be satisfactory, and it is wrong-headed to expect democracy to deliver those other things. Uh, that's on page 112. Later on, he says, um, I resist the idea that the highest human good is political participation. Participation, as Oscar Wilde's quip about socialism taking up too many evenings underlines, can be tedious. Even communitarian Democrats have now begun to concede that too much participation can be counterproductive and that the inescapable scarcity of time entails at a minimum that we are bound to confront decisions about which kinds of uh, participation most matter in our lives. Um, instead, my claim is that essential as democracy is to a tolerable existence, expecting much in the way of spiritual enrichment or edification from it is wrong-headed. Um, and so... Uh, uh, he underlines here, and I think I have one more passage in this regard. Um, let's see. There are limits to how much peop time people have available, so that increased participatory involvement in one domain may mean diminished participation in others. This is what Carmen Siriani has characterized as the paradox of participatory pluralism. It arises for anyone who both values democratic participation and embraces a view of politics that ranges throughout civil society. We cannot simultaneously maximize participation over all domains. Uh, so the view here is uh, democracy, uh, while it can do certain uh, things for us in terms of uh, ordering social, um, uh, you know, social conditions and social hierarchies uh, more justly for us, and that's good for us, uh, that we should not expect you know, the highest human good to be achieved for us in democracy, that it can deliver any sort of spiritual meaning in our lives, and that it can be the panacea for all our problems. It, that's not what it is uh, in, in Shapiro's view. Uh, much more moderate is that it, it helps in some ways to um, uh, allow the conditions for a flourishing life, but in no ways guarantees that, or would participation in politics uh, solve uh, man's individual problems. It is just a tool to uh, uh, have social uh, affairs uh, be just enough so that people can then pursue their individual goods, which is uh, Shapiro makes that point. He certainly says uh, numerous times that people should have the freedom within the democratic constraints to pursue what is good for them, uh, and uh, that democracy should not even encourage the sort of, uh, he makes this argument um, uh, when he's talking about the case of Yoder, um, uh, the, uh, the Amish who pulled the, their uh, children out of school and the Supreme Court was deciding whether this was the right thing. And he uh, questioned um, whether endless self-reflection and, and uh, sort of the philosophic um, questioning of the good is even a good for uh, people in democracies. And he says it, it may not be, uh, that people have the right to pursue their goods without, uncri you know, uncritically and just uh, accept them based on the basis of faith because the sort of... Uh, highly intellectualized uh, critical self-reflection that some philosophers, you know, urge is just not a dominant value of people in democracies. And there's no reason to say that that, on Shapiro's view, is uh, necessarily a bad thing. Because, first of all, um, people have to, uh, w uh, can't spend their whole lives reflecting on what to do. Uh, they have to go out, out and try to achieve what they want to do. Um, so in that sense, uh, he really places a limit on critical self-reflection uh, and democracy's encouragement of that. Um, and so he doesn't view that as being the goal of politics either. Um, neither the fulfillment of people's um, inner being nor sort of the, um, you know, encouragement of this sort of critical self-reflection uh, happening through um, politics. Is either, either of these is viewed as uh, his, um, his uh, preferred alternative. So what does he say that we should do then if, if, if democracy... Um, if uh, democracy cannot, um, is not the highest good for us, it can um, only be used instrumentally, what is it we should do? Uh, well, I think he, he makes the point that we should um, try always to um, uh, make sure that democracy, that we ensure that the hierarchies within democracy um, are, um, uh, are appropriate and that we should have a suspicion of hierarchies. Um, we should, we should uh, look to see where there's hierarchies that are unjust, and that happens so naturally for Shapiro. 
um, that power tends to corrupt, and there's a there's a tendency for the people in power to want to remain in power, and so the hierarchies just naturally atrophy, he says, into systems of domination. So uh, our our efforts, he would say, uh, I think, um, in terms of democratic participation, should always be in in looking to see that the institutions are set up um, properly and non-hierarchically. Um, to some extent, of course, there has to be a hierarchy. You know, not everyone can be on the Supreme Court. Uh, not everyone can be a congressman. So there's this level of hierarchy, but, but it has to be defensible, I think is what Shapiro is saying. And that when it's not defensible, uh, when there's hierarchies that are just self-perpetuating and unjust, those are the hierarchies that we should seek to reform through democracy always, not outside of democracy, but work at making those institutions more democratic. Um, and so the ideal here is of, a, I guess, would be the ideal of a democratic man on the Shapiro angle is to not expect um, uh, much from politics in terms of inner fulfillment, um, not, to expect, not to be drained in it, not to expect it to be at the highest good for him, um, and not to be as deeply skeptical as, as Plato was, but to work to fix uh, democracy where it needs to be fixed, and um, institutionally, not substantively, um, because I think uh, while Shapiro doesn't make this point, I think um, I think we have to come back again to the problem of modern politics. That any sort of sustained political involvement um, is going to run into a lot of the problems we talked about: the the complexity, the the just explosion of politics, and uh, it's something that and the numerous sorts of regulation and laws that contradict each other and overlap. And these are things that um, it, it is very hard now to affect uh, change substantively in politics. Um, and uh, we should, um, uh, someone should think about before getting into this, you know, how wise is it for me to um, uh, delve into this? What realistically can come about from my political involvement? Uh, of course, you can always just rush into it. But uh, the point here is to think about it uh, before. Um, and uh, Shapiro certainly limits our enthusiasm for what's possible from politics individually while still encouraging us, I think, to, um, to pursue um, something, I would say, in terms of a, uh, uh, almost like a conductor. Uh, you know, man is, uh, in this sense, uh, in terms of his relations to politics, would be a conductor, where a conductor in an orchestra begins to, you know, uh, sort of leads, uh, starts to conduct, and, and then everyone else plays their role, and, uh, but he doesn't go and do the individual, he doesn't play every note, he just makes sure that the whole process is running properly, and I think in that sense, um, you know, the democratic person that wants to make an involvement in politics that's likely to be la la lasting and really beneficial would not focus so much on the individual laws, but would focus on making sure the hierarchies are um, legit and uh, whether or not legit to democratize the institutions as much as possible so that the um, different viewpoints and different expressions of, of uh, different people from different walks of life get, ex get expressed and perfected through the political process. Um, and I think that is probably uh, as balanced as, um, uh, as the view as we've seen so far, not excessively shunning politics as, as some authors have done, and not uh, glorifying it as, as the best good. So uh, we'll uh, we'll continue uh, uh, talking about um, uh, politics in later posts. And I hope you all have a good night. Bye bye.